After some reflection, I have come to realize that, biological origins of human sexual behavior notwithstanding, there exists enough evidence to suggest that it can be understood as easily in economic terms as it can be using any other means of analysis, and indeed, approaching the male-female relationship from the context of supply and demand allows for a possible new insight, at least in a highly theoretical, if not improbable, sense on what could come into being to fundamentally alter a behavioral dynamic that has been relatively static for untold millennia. In the same sense, Brifo's law can be seen as not only descriptive, but also carrying economic force and weight. That Brifo's law and the extensions I will add to it are in fact reflective of what one might refer to as laws of supply and demand, and that the reproductive game is just that as well. But first, it would behoove us to recall what Brifo's law actually is, as well as the corollaries to the law suggested by Stickman. I have mentioned in the past that Brifo's law, namely that the female, not the male, determines all the conditions of the animal family, where the female can derive no benefit from association with the male, no such association takes place, is simply put none other than a description of a very basic biological business contract. After all, all contracts are drawn up in order to attain some benefit to the parties involved. Usually both parties are aware of the conditions in the contract and both seek benefit in equal measure. The corollaries produced by Stickman, in fact, are further stipulations in the contract accessible to only the female party. 1. Past benefit provided by the male does not provide for continued or future association. Two, any agreement where the male provides a current benefit in return for a promise of future association is null and void as soon as the male has provided the benefit, see corollary one, and three, a promise of future benefit has limited influence on current future association, with the influence inversely proportional to the length of time until the benefit will be given and directly proportional to the degree to which the female trusts the male. The corollaries are stipulations based on female input, and she will likely act upon them more often than not. And moreover, and more importantly, these stipulations are based on perception of value attributed to the female, and perception in general will be an important factor to consider in this video. Now a common counter-argument is that it is not just women, but men who seek to gain benefits from entering into a relationship, that no one male or female, enters into a relationship with the idea of being disadvantaged. So goes the argument. And unsurprisingly, you'll get no argument from me on this one. The distinction between male and female benefit-seeking is not to be found in generalized statements and counter-arguments such as the aforementioned, but rather in the nitty-gritty details of the contract itself, and more importantly in the laws of supply and demand, which have equal jurisprudence over the human animal as they do over more conventional market products and services. What then are the laws of supply and demand? Law number one. If demand increases and supply remains unchanged, a shortage occurs, leading to a higher equilibrium price. Law two. If demand decreases and supply remains unchanged, a surplus occurs, leading to a lower equilibrium price. Law number three. If demand remains unchanged and supply increases, a surplus occurs, leading to a lower equilibrium price. And four, if demand remains unchanged and supply decreases, a shortage occurs, leading to a higher equilibrium price. If we observe carefully, we will see that for most of human history, only the first law has actually been applicable to the human female, and the second law has been the primary determinant of the human male as of this current date. In fact, it has effectively been a static state of affairs for millions of years. What specifically am I referring to? I am, of course, making reference to the reproductive roles, the services, if you will, conferred upon women and men respectively by biology. Here it is not a question of actual numbers of men and women, but rather a question of function, where the woman represents the limiting factor in reproduction, possessing a uterus, confers high, demand, confers high demand and low supply, where supply is based upon the fact that only one woman can become pregnant 
at any given time and is then burdened with that pregnancy for a period of nine months and that without such a female service the species could at least potentially go extinct. The man, on the contrary, can potentially inseminate thousands of women, meaning his services are of low demand and in high supply, the exact opposite of the female's market status. The primary distinction between actual market supply and demand in a society of available goods is that this status for both men and women has been relatively static, unchanging, and is almost entirely a consequence of biological realities, which is why law number one has remained applicable to human females since humans entered the terrestrial scene, and why one has never really been applied to human males, and two has been the primary descriptor of the human male market value with little change. That is to say that more or less, perceptually, the female, by way of her uterus, has been in high demand with little change to supply, and the male, likewise, has been in low demand with little change to his supply. Three and four of the laws are only theoretically possible within the framework of human sexual biology and could only become valid through intervening technology, something I will return to later in this video. If my observations are correct, and human biological goods can be mapped onto a loose form of supply and demand law, then we also have a powerful explicator for the general trends of male and female behavior in the reproductive arena, and a possible basis for breaking the static nature of that behavior, if means were to be found to directly change the flow of reproductive market goods. Of course, I am talking about what amounts to a perpetual female monopoly being the only bearer of children. This monopoly has created a distortion in supply and demand brought about through perception. This occurs when something as simple as childbearing is perceived to be of greater value than the physical and intellectual labors of men, no matter how much more demanding they might be. Perception is king, after all. Having clarified this, we can observe that human sexual behavior, and by extension most derivative behaviors arising from biologically conferred sexual roles, will be reflective of the relative supply and demand of that person's services as a market good, as well as a function of the perception of his or her value, which is to say perception of value will often dictate behavioral norms as well as differentiated treatment based on perceived sexual marketplace value, whether positive or negative. Let's look at several examples, then. The first example we can take is a re-examination of Brifo's law, which shall henceforth be referred to as Brifo's contract, as well as its corollaries, henceforth called stipulations. The contract is signed by two parties, one female, one male, each one representing certain services contributing to the end goal of reproduction. The Stickman stipulations are additions allowed to the participant of higher market value, distinct advantages that the higher market value signee can retain for herself because she effectively can demand a higher price for her goods than can the male, who must, because of lesser market value, demand less. Under this interpretation, it is not so much that the male is unaware of the female stipulations, but rather his accession to them is a consequence of acknowledgement of her higher marketplace value. Thus, he will necessarily need to make concessions, should he wish to make any profit upon entering Brifo's contract. Concessions the female will never have to make because of perceived higher value. And this is why the counter-argument that men seek benefit from relationships to is a poor one, because it is malformed and it does not acknowledge the superior negotiating position of the female based on her perceived greater value. In the same token, the primary description of Brifo's contract allows us to understand why the female determines the conditions of the animal family, as well as being in a position to add stipulations the male is not entitled to. Think of it as a larger influential company or corporation entering into business relations with a smaller, less influential one. Who has the upper hand? That should be quite clear by now. And this is possibly why we see men not acting in accordance with the stip stigma stipulations that women do in act in accordance with, why they put up with more, why they usually do not terminate the contract upon cessation of benefit perceived or otherwise. They have never been in a position to do so. 
this being a reflection of their market value, their services, and a function of their status within the laws of supply and demand. Or, as Gore writes what once said, a uterus might be worth a million dollars, an ejaculation maybe ten cents. But here we come upon the most important question of perception. The value of anything can ultimately be reduced to human perception. The value of not only paper mo the paper money you hold is based upon human perception, but also that of a hard asset such as gold or silver. As Protagoras of Abdera once said over two millennia ago, of all things the measure is man, of the things that are, that they are, and of the things that are not, that they are not. And this indisputably applies to value, where value is derived from perception. So let us envision a hypothetical scenario where diamonds began to wash up on the banks of the Hudson and Harlem rivers in great quantity and on a near daily basis. It stands to reason that over a certain period of time the value of diamonds would decrease, correlating to law three, namely if demand remains unchanged and supply increases, a surplus occurs leading to a lower equilibrium price. Demand remains the same, supply increases, price, i.e. value, decreases as a consequence of the surplus, and this can be applied to any good. And is here where there is a theoretical, and admittedly highly unlikely, silver lining to the economic story of man and woman. I speak, of course, of some technological event, such as the artificial womb, where the demand for womb remains the same, but through technological advancement, supply increases which would lead to lower prices on female sexual capital, effectively lowering their perceived value. But it does not have to be limited to something such as the artificial womb, as even something much more likely, such as the male pill, could lead to a scenario where the fourth law of supply and demand unfolds, namely, if the demand remains unchanged and supply decreases, a shortage occurs, leading to a higher equilibrium price. In this scenario, the ability of the man to simply withhold his capital, his sperm, as well as his labor, would lead to a decrease in supply and thus to a higher price on his goods. What matters here is, of course, the behavioral consequences of changes in supply and demand in the sexual market. To say that women would depreciate in value and men would appreciate is tantamount to saying that women would lose bargaining power and men would gain, and that men could possibly add their own stipulations to Brefo's contract if they so chose. Truth be told, the last 50 plus years have done just that for women, however, because with the advent of the pill, sperm banks, and the faceless man, aka the state, women have created their own version of the fourth law, where the pill, sperm banks, and abortion have created a decrease in reproductive supply dictated on female terms, with male demand for serv female services remaining the same. Thus we can see the rise of politicized feminism, its acceptance by the common female, as well as typical male acquies acquiescence to it as an acknowledgement of greater perceived value. As if to say that the state and reproductive technologies rendered the human female a precious metal, whereas formerly she was only semi-precious, leading to advanced forms of hypergamy, and other destructive behaviors. But for men, it might not even require the development of such technology. All one might need, at least in theory, is for women to price themselves out of the labor market, which is happening slowly, even as I write this. Imagine if a job working on a North Atlantic oil rig paid a measly 20,000 USD a year, with all the expected dangers attached to such work. Imagine if there had been a time when salaries for such work were much, much higher. The analogy is clear. Women represent that dangerous work on the oil rig for a very low salary, where cost-benefit analysis leads to the conclusion that such labor ought better not be pursued, and that is effectively what MIGTO is, in its current state, a trend and development based on economic analysis of the sexual labor market. Women have effectively become the 20k oil rig job, and MIGTO are ahead of their peers in recognizing this. Or as Barbarossa likes to say, the juice just isn't worth the squeeze. So in theory, 
Much of this could change, in theory, given certain immersion technologies or simply an accurate evaluation of the sexual labor market, but we still have a long way to go. What I am attempting to do here is to provide a theoretical framework within which things actually could change, not through unlikely changes in laws, but through a combination of the organic and the artificial. If my thesis is correct, and human sexual market services adhere to the laws of supply and demand with the attendant consequences, then this simply becomes a question of time. When will the requisite technologies be introduced for men? When will the labor market be properly surveyed by men on the whole? Unfortunately, I cannot make a prediction either way, but I hope to have at least adduced some evidence to suggest that if perception is power, then the means of changing perception are at least theoretically attainable. Thanks for watching.